started here. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I am very happy to see so many of you who have come out today. Uh, my name is Keisha Rogers and I'm with the Schiller Institute. We are here today to discuss with a very important and special guest. Actually, we'll hear uh, from two special guests in a moment, uh, Mr. Tom Weissmuller and Mr. Larry Bale. And uh, he's come to join our panel in our discussion here. And I'll introduce them uh, brief in a few moments briefly. I just wanted to set the stage on why we're here and the sense of urgency that we have to have about the direction of our nation and the world. Uh, as many of you received the invitation to this event, the event we rightly titled The Elimination of Poverty, Not CO2, Humanity's Future Lies in Space. And I also want to subtitle that as There Are No Limits to Growth. And this is going to be, in essence, the feature of our discussion today because what we're in the midst of is a knockout brawl and fight against the progress of mankind by those individuals who believe that human beings who are destroying the planet by emitting too much CO2, it should be eliminated. And this is the policy right now that you saw and that was emphatically coming out of, if people watch the UN climate meeting, the UN General Assembly in New York, where major heads of state just met. But I want to focus on particularly um, showing, okay, go back to this. Two, there you go. Sorry, there we go. Two people um, who were in, who were very much uh, a part of this operation in terms of uh, at the UN General Assembly meeting. And first of all, to, to say to you that the Schiller Institute and our organization nationally and internationally have exposed what has been behind the recent ongoing policies around the climate strikes uh, that have taken place in the recent period. You probably heard that there were thousands of young people that were pushed out onto the streets from their classrooms, who, uh, young children who were, uh, what, who were pushed out there to say that school is not important. We need to focus on the fact that our, that our future is at stake right now, that the world is going to boil over in less than 12 years, in 11 years or so. Uh, hopefully your children weren't participating in this <laughs> fiasco. Um, <laughs> and so, but the leader of that ring show is this poor deranged child here that has been <laughs> proselytized on behalf of, you know, first of all, Mrs. Uh, the young lady, Greta Turnberg, her name might be familiar with you all by now. Uh, she's the leader of the youth uh, CO2 reduction policy. Uh, and Greta Turnberg had a very strong message at the UN General Assembly, uh, Turnberg, on, uh, on her speech. And as you can see here, um, she's really showing how spoiled she is as she says, we are at the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? Um, now, this child did not make herself. She's only 16 years old. Uh, she, so the question is, what's behind this? All of these third graders who were leaving school, standing out on the streets. They didn't get out there by themselves. Somebody had to fund and put them out there. And uh, uh, there's a number of people that I can discuss with you, and I'll tell you how you can find out about more of these people, but I want to pinpoint another spoiled adult uh, who is highly privileged adult. His name is uh, Mr. Mark Carney. He is the Bank of England governor, and Mark Carney actually gave a speech at the UN General Assembly. I'm not going to read the whole speech, but I can tell you um, 
you know, I'm not even going to read it at all, but his, <laughs> remarks, <laughs> his remarks are given during the uh, UN's climate meeting. But Mark Carney not only spoke at the climate meeting, but he also, prior to this, spoke at an event at Jackson Hole where he discussed that the banking apparatus, the financiers of the world, had to focus on putting their funding into, all funding has to go into uh, reducing climate emissions to bringing climate emissions down to zero, uh, zero emissions. And everybody's talking about this by the year of 2030, 2050. He wants to push this even faster. Uh, part of his speech, he said, changes in climate policies, technologies, and physical risks in the transition to the net zero world will prompt reassessment of the values of virtually every asset. The financial system will reward companies that adjust and punish, uh, and, uh, that adjust and punish those that don't. And just to make it plain and simple to you, what he's saying here is that if companies are not moving with the green speculative agenda, green agenda to reduce climate car carbon commissions, zero carbon commissions, then they're going to be strongly punished for this. They will be starved of credit, as he said. They will not be able to get credit from the banks. So now, our organization, uh, our international organization with the Schiller Institute uh, and the Rich Movement has just taken the gloves off on this apparatus by producing this very important report here called CO2 Reduction is a Mass Murder Policy Designed by Wall Street and the City of London. Because you have to understand right now that the bank bankers have made it very clear that as they're calling for pumping more quantitative easing, more bailouts of the financial system, they also know that that plan didn't work in 2007, 2008, and it's not going to work now. And their policy is we have to actually uh, put some major strong measures against the growth and productivity of the population by saying we're only going to invest in this green agenda. So now, again, I would encourage you, first of all, everybody to read this report. You can uh, talk to my colleagues here. Uh, Ron's standing back there by the coffee. He can tell you how you can inquire about uh, the gain report. So now what I want to tell you about is what we've been doing. Uh, on the streets and not just organizing people in meetings like this. We've been having uh, meetings around the country, town hall meetings, discussing what your role is to ensure that this policy of what is rightly called brainwashing, molestation, uh, and completely dis uh, destroying our young people right now. Well, we need to be focusing on what is a real future in, for our young people. Should they be on the streets proselytizing for the bankers, or should they be actually given a future in the progress of mankind in space? And I am excited because some of you in here don't know, but uh, you're in a wealth of knowledge in this room because some of my colleagues, some of my friends that are sitting in here, uh, they actually were instrumental in getting us to uh, achieving President John F. Kennedy's goal of getting us to the moon. And we need to actually understand right now that the progress of our young people has to be toward a mission in the solar system, that there are no limits to growth. So I'm going to uh, go through just a couple more things here. I just wanted to kind of set the stage for this because so you can understand what we're up against. Um, first of all, I, I want to show that I'm trying to find my video. Okay, I got to go down after that. Okay, here we go. That's what I was looking for.
city council. And when you had the Houston, when you had the climate strikes and young people out in front of the Houston City Council, you know, the first thing that they were saying was that, you know, this is Mother Nature, this is Imelda Harvey, we can't the reason that this is happening is because you human beings are not doing your job. You're not reducing your carbon emissions. And so we actually took this on right in front of the mayor. Uh, my colleague Joel and I testified in front of the city council, and I'll just let you hear. It's a very brief, I think it's like two or three minutes. Hear what we had to say and give you some encouragement of what you can do to cha challenge your elected officials as well. Council, my name is Keisha Rogers, and I stand before you today to say that I am proud to be a carbon-based life form. <coughs> The world needs more CO2. Each of you and everyone in this room must put an end to the spread of the culturally induced pessimism and the child abuse against our children and their future. Hands down, CO2 reduction is a mass murder policy designed by Wall Street and the City of London. You have received excerpts from a special report released by Executive Intelligence Review, one of the leading intelligence publications founded by American economist Linda LaRouche, and I appeal to each of you to read the report and the press release in the report. Let me ask you a question. How many Greta Thunbergs does it take to screw in a light bulb? None, because Greta doesn't believe in light bulbs. She believes that it is better for you to be in the dark. If that means Okay, is it right after? Thank you. The next speaker, Mr. Joel DeGene. To be followed by Mr. Colin, Colin Boston. Greetings. Uh, my name is Joel DeJean with the Shiller Institute and the Rouge Political Action Committee. It's time for adults to start acting like adults instead of scared little children. Uh, I hope not to be as hysterical as Greta Thunderberg, who is backed by billionaires and bankers like Michael Bloomberg and the Bank of England. 
I'm sure you've, you've all heard the whining crybabies who were screeching about reducing our carbon footprint and eliminating petroleum in the next 10 years. Otherwise, the world's going to boil over. Well, with no basis in thermodynamics, physics, chemistry, and based on flaky computer models, these poor children are, are calling for eliminating the lifeblood of our economy. What would happen to the Petro Metro <coughs> if we got rid of petroleum in the next 10 years? Well, I was born in the nation with the lowest carbon footprint in the Western Hemisphere. It also happens to be the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. If you want to see what would happen to Houston without petroleum, go to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, where there is no sewage treatment, no clean water, no reliable electrical system. Now, the alternative for these abused kids is to be given a future based on the upcoming Artemis project, where we are going back to the moon in the next five years, and eventually on to Mars in the coming decades. If we were to teach these children real science and train them to be part of this great space program, then we can develop the things like fusion power, which would be the eventual replacement for petroleum, but it would be a replacement based on higher energy densities instead of the backward technologies like windmills and solar panels. If we were to base our economy on windmills and solar panels, we would have to reduce the world's population to less than one billion people. And that would be a greater genocide than what Hitler could ever have dreamed of. So there is a future. The world is not going to end in, in 11 years. But we have to give these kids a, a future based on science. Time has expired. Thank you so very much. Okay. So I, I'm not going to go through these a lot. I just want to show them as schematics um, just briefly here because what you should I interrupt for a second? Sure, you may. Did you get any feedback? <laughs> <laughs> whatsoever from those people who you were addressing? Uh, they actually, oh, well, that's a good question. Because the feedback that we got was that they were all too chicken shit to, uh, <laughs> to talk to us in front of the whole group. There were two of the, uh, two of the council members who actually pulled us out, met us around, one of them himself personally met us around to find out more about what we were doing. The other one uh, sent his representative and staffer out there to ask us more questions about what we're doing. So they were definitely uh, shocked and stunned. I remember this is election time, so they weren't, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they weren't going to be caught dead actually showing what they thought. Go ahead, you guys. Uh, I think it's just, it, it, it's a very important to point out that the reason for no questions, no comments, uh, you have to hide behind the banister, you know, to speak softly, is because Lyndon LaRouche has not been exonerated. Lyndon LaRouche has been called every name in the book. He was framed up and thrown into jail by the same people trying to attack Trump. And people are scared politically to collaborate with him openly. And of course, that goes for a lot of the American public as well, who don't really know anything about them, which they just heard nonsense in the media. Right, and they want to, yeah, and they're scared to take this off. They don't want to take on the banker. The yeah. um, just real quick, so, I, can, I was there. The, the next person who spoke was actually for the Green Movement, <laughs> and he laid out the general line and basically called on them to start riding bicycles give up meat and whatever. And this was right in their face after Christian Joe had just spoken. It was the total opposite. 
And then he never reacted to that either. It was <laughs> Did you ask him how he got <laughs> there to City Hall? <laughs> was it on a bicycle? He rode his own bicycle down there. There's hypocrites <laughs> beyond. Very much a hypocrite, exactly. If they really believe it, they give up cars. They give up everything. And electricity. But they're not. Um, so, you know, Joel in his, in his comments were actually talk, it was talking about, you know, the question of poverty and the question of the state of, of Haiti, uh, you know, as an example of, of what you will see, what the world will look like, uh, lights out if we have a zero carbon policy. Uh, this is a schematic that was done by someone that all of you should know, especially people who uh, were involved in the, the space community, uh, by a, a very good collaborator and, and friend of the Schiller Institute. He started to work with us during uh, the foundation uh, by Mr. LaRouche of the, the Fusion Energy Foundation, but his name was, he, his name, he's passed, a, a, passed away now, um, Kraft Erika. And Kraft Erika was a German American, uh, German American engineer, aerospace scientist, and he actually wasn't just a great engineer. He was someone who took the gloves off on this limits to growth, par, uh, Malthusian, you know, Parson Malthus uh, policy, and he wrote a number of different books on this. But what he shows. His process was that the growth process of humanity has to be that there are no limits to growth and that you actually have to look at the world that we live in as not a closed world system because he makes the point that in a closed world system where you say that you only have limited resources, where you can only have so many people on the planet and so forth, and that if you have nations pitted against each other geopolitically through wars and famine, then that is part of a closed world system. And this is, this is exactly, this schematic here shows you exactly what it was that Joel was talking about. This wasn't, oh, you know, poor Haiti, you know, they're, they're just some of the unlucky ones. Poor uh, countries throughout Africa, they're just some of the unlucky ones who aren't able to develop. This is an intentional policy, and um, I won't, I, I know you might have just eaten your lunch, so I won't um, <laughs> gross you out too much, but uh, people think that Thomas Malthus was just somebody who said that when the geometric growth of, of, of agricultural production uh, mm -hmm. versus the exponential growth of, of population, but and talked about why there wasn't enough resources to sustain, to abstain, or to sustain, excuse me, to sustain, sustain the amount of population on the planet. Now, this guy was, this is his policy right here, really no growth. His, the policy that Joel talked about is embedded in this statement here. Uh, as he says, all children who are born beyond what would be required to keep up the population to a desired level must necessarily perish unless room be made for them by the death of grown persons. Now, I'm not making this up, people. Uh, therefore, we should facilitate instead of foolishly and vainly endeavoring to impede the operations of nature in producing this mortality. And if we dread the too frequent visitations of the horrid form of famine, we should sedulously encourage the other forms of destruction, which we, com which we compel nature to use. There's more, but just think about that. Uh, so, so there was a book uh, that was written uh, as as I said, um, the collaboration by by uh, our great friend Kraft Erica. Uh, later on, 
the policies of the Club of Rome, of the Malthus policy was, as we know, everybody probably saw the book, there are limits to growth. We counted this, uh, a book that was written by Mr. LaRouche called There Are No Limits to Growth. And uh, I encourage people to, to get a copy of that to read it because that's what we're going to be talking about in just a few moments here when I introduce Tom. Because the key thing right now in understanding that there are no limits to growth is that mankind is unique and different from the animal. That mankind does not have to live in the gutters and the swamps and uh, be uh, put into conditions of poverty. We can actually create more resources. We can develop new breakthroughs in science. Um, that we can actually explore out into the solar system. And we can come to understand that our responsibility as a species is to mm. multiply, subdue, and subdue the earth. And we can, and so this was, this is the optimistic side, should we say, of craft era systematics. What happens with an open world system when you don't have a society controlled by bankers and geopolitics and uh, all of that? And so finally, I, as I go on to, to Tom here, and I'm going to introduce him now. Um, whoa, that's backwards. Sorry. OK. There we go. I got it. Um, I just want to introduce Tom with this quote, because we are at a moment right now where, look, this is not about trying to debate the, yes, if you want the scientific facts, and we're open to more, there's a lot of this in here, you know, why the, there's the fraud of the, um, of the charts and graphs and so forth that, that the climate changers are putting out as a, you know, when you talk about Al Gore, you know, like he knows anything about what he's talking about. This guy doesn't care. They don't care about if you guys know the science. I'm telling they don't you, want you to know they the don't science. want you to know the science. So, so <laughs> they want the money. Well, science is in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Their science is fraud. Um, it's a, so the key thing right now is that we actually have to get to the real question of the fight at hand, which is a question of the nature of human beings. Um, that human beings are not destroying the planet. Uh, that we can actually grow the planet, and that it is our mission to go out and explore into the solar system. So this, this quote says it here. Uh, human beings are absolutely distinguished from beasts by virtue of the fact that every normal newborn infant has what is sometimes called the divine spark of reason. This spark, if developed, enables each of us to develop the power of creative reasoning, the quality of reasoning typified by the work of the best scientific discoverers. Goes on to say, such persons are potentially of great benefit to both contemporary society and future generations. One new useful idea discovered by such an individual mind is of benefit to all mankind. This benefit is partly directed, it is also indirect partly direct, it is also indirect. New, better ideas to come will start from the most advanced discoveries of preceding scientists. So that's what we were, we're here to talk about. The, the optimism of the future lies in the idea that there are no limits to growth. And so let me, oops, I just lost my, um, sorry, give me one second here. Let me move forward here. OK, many of you don't need the introduction to my good friend Tom, who's um, made another one of those long journeys, but had a lot of time to think on his way out here because he drives out here all the way from Maine. I don't know how he does it. Guys. <laughs> Should have ridden your bicycle. Should have ridden your bicycle. Yeah. At least he didn't fly, Tom. <laughs> 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 exactly. So, um, you know, Tom is actually uh, one of the founding members of NAS the NASA uh, TRCS, or what's called the Right Climate Stuff. We have some members here. Also, Tom has some 
knowledgeable background in terms of uh, the fact that he was trained as a meteorologist uh, at the university, uh, New York University, and also uh, Royal Dutch Weather Bureau in Amsterdam. He worked for five years throughout NASA before and after the moon landings, uh, and has given a number of lectures at NASA and various other places. So I'll let him tell you more about what he's doing, but uh, uh, he is going to continue on this discussion of the idea that there are no limits to growth and combating this whole policy of the uh, reduction policy, but what we need to do to think about the positive direction that we're going in. So without any further ado, I'll bring Tom up. I don't deserve any applause, you know? Well, well, you deserve more from... applause than that girl. <laughs> I, I don't have a script. I do want to mention one thing that was in Keisha's next to last slide. And that was that this spark of reason, if developed, <laughs> can lead to many great things. Greta Thunderbird made an <laughs> exception. Yeah. And maybe I'll sit down here. Yeah, I'll let you guys can't so hear me. See the, also, so we can see the slides. Yeah, you're, you're okay. you can see the slides. I'm not worried about that. Uh, I want to start off first by distinguishing human beings from every other species on this planet. And you see a lot of efforts by people to save this red-tailed hawk, or this turtle, or lizard, or some other species. And species diversity is a very nice thing. I don't have a problem with that. But what I want to make sure you understand is that the one species worth saving is the human species. We can do things that no other species on Earth can accomplish. None. And I'll give you a lot of examples, all right? How many dolphins <coughs> can put an IV into their bloodstream and take out their blood and measure what's in it so that they won't get diseases? How many birds can build highways? How many alligators can build skyscrapers and improve their environments? How many crows can launch a Hubble Space Telescope into space, look out at the universe, and realize where they are and where they may be going? There's one and only one species that can do those things. I can list many others. And you get the benefit of what your colleagues have done. When you came here, you likely drove on a road that was built by hundreds and hundreds of construction workers, cement pourers, rebar uh, placers, mm -hmm. was done a long time ago. You're getting the benefit of what they did. The infrastructure of this country is benefiting everybody else in this country. There is no job that people have that you don't benefit from. I mentioned a few in the medical sciences and the construction sciences. I'm gonna be talking about NASA too in a few minutes. But look at yourselves, you are unique. You do things that no species could ever hope to accomplish. So if you're gonna save a species, which one are you gonna pick? <laughs> and what are you gonna to do to make sure that they flourish? Well, for one thing, you can do what we are not doing. The World Bank is refusing to allow any nation in Africa to <laughs> borrow money to build a coal plant to electrify that country. They're saying, oh yeah, yeah you can put some solar panels up and, and a windmill here and there, but when the wind <coughs> doesn't blow at night, there is no electricity. 
we need to allow people who are sending their kids into the jungle every day to pick up firewood so they can boil water so they don't get river blindness. They need to get electricity. They need to get power so that their kids can go to school and discover cures for cancer, new principles of economics, new uh, applications of medicine, contribute to the world. And that's why that key phrase that Keisha had in her slide is important. If developed, we are preventing by policies many billions of people from developing to the extent that they could to help and join the human race for the betterment of everybody. We're living here in America in a golden age. You take people from South America or Africa or the Middle East and you plunk them in Houston and they are stunned by what they see. We have something that they could dream about if they even knew about enough about it to dream. We need to export that to the world. Every human being deserves to live like the human beings in this part of the world live. It's imperative that they can all get educated, <coughs> that they can all contribute, that they, they too can contribute to infrastructure, build new roads. You go out on that 610 and you can see these new intersections that are being developed. A few years from now, you're gonna smoothly glide through them. <laughs> <laughs> it will happen, right? Because of the ingenuity, the engineering, the construction prowess, and the ability of your fellow human beings. You're taking advantage of, you're riding on their shoulders the same way that Newton described him sitting on the beach that he was riding on the on the shoulders of giants who had, who had preceded him. You are the giants of today. You need to educate your children. You need to make sure that they can exceed what you have already achieved, what you have helped achieve. And now, I could spend a lot of time telling you what species can do what, but if you walk into any hospital today, you walk into any museum today, you see things that no species on Earth, other than humans, could accomplish. And I hope you don't need the hospital, but it's there when you need it. And it will help you. And it will help people in your family. And it will help the nation, it will help the world. We need to export that ability. We need to develop it, like you said, Keisha. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that I was, had the privilege of being involved with uh, is working at NASA for a number of years. And I'm gonna go through an old slide set I have here <coughs> and describe some of the things uh, that we accomplished at NASA that weren't done before. Uh, and I'm gonna stop right here for a second because I would love to see and hear Larry Bell maybe expound on what I just talked about before I get into the NASA stuff, if you want. You're, you're, th this is a brilliant guy who is here at Keisha's invitation. I wasn't planning to talk. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I always do. <laughs> and, and you get wisdom with a capital W underlined with exclamation points, if you wish. Let me make, I'll make a few general comments. Uh, I have a lot of interests uh, with regard to space. I've been pretty active. Max Sajay was my partner. We started Space Industries together. Uh, Chris Kraft and Bob Gilbert were on our board. And Neil Armstrong was. And I've been blessed in my life to know some really neat people. Buzz Aldrin's one of my best friends. I've been for 40 years. We're doing a book together on beyond footprints and flagpoles, and Buzz is an incredible guy. He and George Abbey and another couple of friends of mine probably have the best memories I've ever known in my life. He's just an absolute incredible memories guy. Uh, 
my first book, I write a lot. I've written over 600 articles for Forbes and Newsmax. I'm kind of a compulsive writer. I type with two fingers, <laughs> which is really the main thing. My fingers are much longer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I get seven or eight books I've written, and I brought some along to kind of show you some. My first book I just want to mention was uh, dedicated to Al Gore, ah. <laughs> whose invention of the internet, internet made it possible, and the invention of fact made it necessary. A little louder, please. Yeah. Can you speak up louder? Yeah. yeah, my first book was dedicated to Al Gore, whose invention of the book made it possible, and internet made it possible, and the invention of fact <laughs> made it necessary. It was Climate Eruption was the name of the book. And, uh, and then it's kind of popular demand. I, you know, I didn't plan, I never planned to write a book, but I, uh, wrote another book, Scared Witless, Prophets and Prophets of Climate Doom, uh, a couple years ago. And uh, so I, I, I fancy I know a bit about climate. Uh, the famous Michael Mann uh, with his hockey stick graph that was going to light the world on fire. I guess I was very pleased that Tim Ball, uh, at least so far, has prevailed. And that, that, that you won. You won. You totally won. Yeah, yeah. So that. That case has probably been thrown out. We'll, we'll see if it's appealed. But uh, I just I want to say that in my my first book, Paul well, Cunningham wrote a dedication to it that I thought was very apt, and I think it's here picks up what you're saying. And it, I'm not going to quote it exactly, but in in the space program, the science wasn't perfect, and everyone knew that. But it was the best we had, and the people that went. Uh, said this is good enough, you know, you know, there's a lot of unknowns when, when Buzz and Neil went to the moon and I knew them both. Uh, you know, they didn't know what kind of surface they were going to land on, they didn't know if was, we have a pirate technique display when the dust caught on, you know, on blaze and so on. Both of them told me individually that they thought there was about a 50-50 chance they would come back. And uh, God, I wouldn't accept those kind of odds. But, uh, but they went because, as Walt said, we, we believe in the science. If we, if we did it wrong, and if you folks did it wrong, and you folks that are here did it wrong, there would be deaths, and there would be a loss of a mission, and you know what challenges are going to almost cost, cost us the whole program. And so we're very risk top, uh, you know, not intolerant, and very, you know, we, we don't want to make mistakes. Bureaucrats hate mistakes. Bridge builders accept them, uh, bureaucrats hate them because they don't get credit if they're successful and they get blamed if they're not so on. But if we look at the mistakes we've made in climate, which is, I think, I, I think they go beyond mistakes. I, I think they go way, way beyond mistakes. And they cover up for, you know, for foolish errors, they, you know, the, the temperature records are, are screwy, uh, they, they, they doctor the, the books, they do everything imaginable, and they get away with it, just the way they get away with everything else in you know, today in the media, nobody does any fact checking. You can say there's more hurricanes and they're more, you know, more severe and so on. Like I didn't check the normal records, it's not true at all. Imagine if the, if the hurricane had hit the Yellowstone at the turn of the century, last century, it had happened today with the population we have, imagine, instead of 12,000 people dead, imagine what the death was. So, 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 the point is that uh, that NASA has taken a pride, and our country has taken a pride in getting it right on science. So we're so absolutely tolerant of, of just bogus science, pseudoscience, when it comes to climate. Some of the worst culprits are the Texas A&M University. They're just really, really bad people. Mm. And I could name names. And, 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 uh, <laughs> we know some of them. Yeah, yeah. but uh, it's time we get it right. It's time that our kids not only appreciate science, but appreciate the importance of accurate science. And science is always evolving. I want to mention two, two other two other books. I've written a couple of books really. I'm kind of on a run on on where technology is taking us, and it goes again to science. One is previous one is reinventing ourselves, and said. I was kind of taking, it's how, you know, how technology is rapidly and radically tra transforming our lives. Is there anything from social media to the fact that our, our, our cell phones are listening to us and all the other crazy things. And, and middle-aged girls are being uh, body shamed and committing suicide because of trolls, you know, that, that 
make comments. I mean, it's the, the ability for people to, to hide behind rocks and, 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 and the media and attack, and we're seeing an awful lot of that in the organization politics. That, that technology is both a tremendous gift, you know, and I, I'm a cancer survivor and I'm so appreciative of, of what technology does, but it's also, it's, it's also our worst fear, and it's a matter of trying to reconcile that, you know, are we going to have, are we gonna, can we live with uh, facial recognition cameras on every lamppost like they do in China? They'll have their merit system Go implemented next year, so if you walk your dog, if you don't your dog's out on a leash, maybe your kid won't get into college. I mean, it's absolute insanity, but then again, it pales compared to the insanity we're seeing in Congress today, so. <laughs> so, so, so we're, seeing, we're seeing tremendous transformation because of technology, and it's happening so fast. We can Skype with Grandma, but also Skype's watching us when we're, you know, when we're in the bedroom. So, so, you know, so, so that's that's a double thing. Book that just came out last week is Weaponization of AI and the Internet. It just came out, and and that's where it kind of gets scary because when we put all this technology in the hands of, of Silicon Valley people and very few people, it's an enormous power thing. I mean, they have you can imagine companies that have a, a trillion dollars in assets. That have global outreach that can that can that can monitor and, and censor and disinform people globally. Uh, they they manage the, 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 the most advanced technology. And now you're going to hear smart cities where you're going to have your refrigerator and your smart meter hooked up to the surveillance camera on the other end of town, reporting whether you ate too many hamburgers this week, <laughs> and whether you whether you whether you exceeded your BTO allocation. From, Climate justice and energy justice, because because the windmill broke down the other end of town. Um, you know, and, and it's, 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 we're going into a very insane period right now, where where the technology that's also transformative is a technology that's very very terrifying in terms of how much control it puts in in a few people's hands. As I as I dive deeper into this stuff, I'm writing a book now on cyber terrorism. I won't, I won't leave you that because you won't be sleeping tonight, but everybody's got bucks in everybody's grid. Everybody breaks everybody else's election. We do it. A lot of them steal our, our NSA technology to do it. Uh, you know, this, this is pervasive, and it's something, it's an unwinnable thing because now, you know, you, you can do it to Korea, but they, North Korea, but they don't have any grid to knock out. So the more wired you are, the more vulnerable you are. And so, and so it's, it's the issue that technology that, that we rely upon so much. One little vignette, our transformer blew near our house yesterday, and I kept flicking switches. I knew, now I knew the power was off, but I feel like the switch is an extension of my hand. You know, I don't even think, well, of course, of course, of course my garage door is going to go off. Well, no, it didn't. You know, because we're so <coughs> literally wired that we just imagine electricity is there. And suddenly, it, it said, hold on, hold on, whoa, 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 I put the switch and my glass of light doesn't go on. No, there must be something wrong here. And so, and so technology is, is a great blessing. We can't uninvent it. We can't go back. But I think in our society today, we have to realize there's a big price. This, this book has a, has a frog and a, a pan of hot water in it, and it's, the notion is, 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 it's like the boiling frog, you know, we, well, we, we say, well, technology is, is so comforting and it gives us security and it gives us convenience. Uh, and all, all I have to do is give away a little more of your privacy every, every day. Well, why do we care if, if, they, if they monitor our data mine where our car goes and, and how much time we spend in the store? You know, I've, I'm going to Washington in a couple of weeks and I just mentioned that and I'm getting now emails from Washington hotels. <laughs> uh, uh, sure, it's just a coincidence, right? Uh, so, so we live in a we live in a scary time, and and I guess change is always scary. And there's always the tendency to say, well, you know, change change is bad, and change is well. In any case, it's transformative, and we need to educate, as as, as Keisha is saying and Tom is saying, we need to prepare our children for a brave new world, and they need to prepare us for a brave new world. Because it's going to be their world, they're going to create it, and I think the one continuing thing that we, we can hope to give them is values. And we draw values from, from our own models, and I think NASA has been a model. Achievement is a model, I think capitalism is a model. You know, you, 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 you believe that you can somehow 
make your life better, make other people's lives better, because incentives are great, and, and the rewards are great when you feel like you've earned something. And to instill these kinds of values, I think, today, in the political climate we have is, is so critical. Let's see if we're up to it. I, I'm sorry to talk so long. I think one of the things Larry is saying is that we're at a point in time where we're diverging. We're diverging either into freedom and development of intellect or control by people who have no other motive in mind but to control everything you do and channel all your efforts in ways that they want, not what you want. You deserve the freedom and you deserve the divergence that allows you to succeed and excel. And that's a neat, neat inter, uh, introduction to the NASA slides because at NASA we did something where we did excel. And we invented processes that made it happen. And the rationale for going to the moon may have been, in John F. Kennedy's eyes, a race with the Russians. But it was a race to develop and then subsequently exploit technology. And it was done within a 10-year period. And I think we did a beautiful job in doing that. And one of the reasons or rationales for exploring further into space is to continue developing that technology. And if you notice, it spread all over the world. The miniaturization that was needed in a space program ended up in computers, ended up in a cell phone you can hold in your hand that has uh, a magnet, a magnitude's more uh, computing power than what we use to land on the moon. But it was, the early motivation was to save weight. Then later on we found out that yes, uh, you can develop integrated circuits that work faster, can do more in less time, and we are all reaping the benefit from, from that. And by the way, how many antelopes have a cell phone that they can contact their cousins, sort of, right? You really need to understand how the human race has leapfrogged the rest of the species on this planet. And NASA has helped. NASA has helped, and by the way, you know, we have helped the Russians, and we have helped the Chinese, and we have helped the Indians, because they have piggybacked on our efforts the same way that you piggyback on the highway that's been built outside here. These are great achievements of humanity. They are not able to be replicated by any other species on the planet. Kind of keep that in your mind. Let's see if I can go through some of these slides. This is a presentation that I did quite a while ago. You notice at the top here, uh, there's a little logo here. This is one that was designed by Buzz Aldrin. All right, it has a NASA logo. By the way, you notice in a NASA logo, the flourish goes in this direction. In Buzz's thing, it goes in the other direction. Now, why is that? Because Buzz wants to turn the agency around into a different direction. And where is he going? You can't quite see it here, but here is Phobos and here is Deimos, the two moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. What's Phobos? Phobos is the fast-moving inner moon of Mars goes around a planet three times in one day. It's, and very close to the surface, too. And I have some slides that will show you what that looks like. Uh, now, how do I move these slides? Oh, just page down. Just, just a, the down side. one like this? Yeah. Yeah, Great. You have to, yeah. All right. Hey, that's not bad. Yeah. Where, where is NASA going? Well, got two pictures of the moon here. This is the one you always see. This is Luna Far Side. Well, guess what? The Chinese got there. And they got there ahead of us. And they put a lander down there. And they, too, have piggybacked on technology that was developed at NASA for the benefit of the whole human race. That's very important. Uh, so where should NASA be going? We want to build structures on the moon. We want to mine and look for helium-3. We want to find water on the moon. 
We think we can do it at the lunar south pole. There are craters there that never see sunlight. We believe that there is water in those craters and helium-3. Why do you want helium-3? Helium-3 is the cheapest, easiest way to achieve fusion. Because you take those helium molecules, knock them together, they produce heat. Have, do we have a way of controlling that heat? Uh -huh, not yet. But we're working simultaneously to do that. And the moon is the best place to find it. Now here's Buzz again, <laughs> all right? Buzz is standing underneath Stonehenge, and he's got his t-shirt. Get your ass to Mars. Buzz sees beyond what most people in this country see. And it's not getting to Mars that makes a lot of sense. It's developing the technology that allows you to get to Mars. There are many, many difficulties in getting to the uh, Mars. Believe me, Mars is far harder than the moon. Puts, I don't need a chair. I can stand up and do this, but thank you. Uh, so there, there are reasons to do that. So here, here we go. Where should NASA be going? I say you should go to Mars. I think we should go to Mars. I think we should go to Phobos. Yeah. This is what Mars looks like. Good pictures. We have a number of landers on Mars. We've, we've done some, some exploration. Uh, we've even named most of the features on Mars. Some of them are called Arabia, Eden. I think some of these kind of come out of uh, mythology. Utopia. But Mars is, is a known body to us now, mainly because it has a nice transparent atmosphere we can see down on it. Venus, unfortunately, does not. And I'll talk about the possibility of terraforming Venus later on. Don't let me get away without doing that. Okay. All right. Uh, this is a fanciful way of getting to Mars. Why this came out of a science fiction movie. Why do I say it's fanciful? Well, they, they had this rotating part here, which will simulate 1G of gravity. If we had fusion power, we could, we could have a mythical 1G engine. We're halfway to Mars, you're at 1G, and the astronaut's very comfortable. And then when you turn the rocket around, put on the brakes, and you can do that at 1G, and you, you end up determining what, you know, when you get to Mars. Well, we don't have a fusion engine yet, so the next best thing is to have rotating spacecraft, big windows, and this is out of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. You don't need windows in the spacecraft. That was from Ron's plan. Uh, no, no, no. That, that's his version of a space station. This is actually on a spacecraft heading to Mars. This is not a space station. This is how you're going to get to Mars. But we don't need windows in a spacecraft. Why? All you need is a tiny porthole and a big flat screen TV inside. <laughs> and you can see everything you want. And structurally, it's a lot better for a spacecraft. <coughs> but again, this is Hollywood. Uh, but you're going to get to Mars. Well, this is Phobos. This is what I believe should be the first step. Number one, Phobos is that fast-moving inner moon of Mars. We don't need to have as much fuel to get to Phobos. Why? Because when we get to Mars, when we put the brakes on, we're going to catch up to that fast-moving moon. The geology on Phobos is absolutely fascinating. This is ice or snow or frozen carbon dioxide. Look at the strings of meteors, of meteor hits that have happened here. Uh, there's an awful lot to learn about Phobos, and like I say, it's easy, easy to get to. And by the way, when we, when we get back, when we want to go back to Earth, you go from the other side of the planet, you get a boost, because you're getting a boost from that fast-moving moon. Again, you're going to save fuel. We don't have the ability to land on and get off Mars yet today. We do have that ability to land on and get off of Phobos. Uh, here's some of the... These are the 10 places that they want to explore on Phobos. They've already figured out what they want to look for, how wide what they want to see. What's the diameter? Uh, Phobos is about a 20th the diameter of our own moon. It's quite small. However, it's a lot bigger than Deimos, the other moon. Uh, so here's a mythical space station. I don't happen to like this architecture, but we have plenty of time to figure this out. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you can see how, how close the SEP by the means of solar electric propulsion. And it's a tug that is designed to explore the moon itself. We're going to take off land. This is what you'd see if you're standing on Phobos. You're really close to Mars. <laughs> All right? Uh, it is a very good place to explore and map uh, the rest of the planet for future landings. Uh, now, now I'm going to get into what NASA has accomplished 
okay? And uh, there are a number of areas. Clothing is one of them, high-tech fabrics, fireproof garments, we have to develop fiber, uh, fireproof spacesuits. Mm -hmm. uh, insulation, uh, Velcro is usually given credit. Although NASA didn't invent Velcro, they certainly adopted it when they were using it. Uh, medicine. You can't walk into a hospital today and not be exposed to things that were outgrowths of the space program. It's impossible. MRIs, CAT scans, insulin pumps, all these things were developed because we wanted to monitor astronauts' uh, health, physical situation remotely while they were in space. Uh, lots of uh, advances in human safety that you will find in, in a hospital. Um, technology manager. Na NASA didn't excel in building things. NASA excelled in managing things. Uh, the work breakdown structure was one of the things that NASA relied on. What they basically did is you took a task and you busted it down into little pieces, lots and lots and lots of little pieces. When they all came together, you had a spacecraft. The early work breakdown structures that I worked on when I was at the agency had open blocks. Some of them were green. That means we did them already. We knew how to do them. Some of them were yellow, which means we probably could. And some of them were red. And the red ones, we didn't know how to do yet, but we were hoping people could find out how to do them. And when they all switched green, we had a work breakdown structure that would work. And this went down to the s size and strength of the screws that we were putting into spacecraft that we know would hold them together and, uh, and would work. We had open patents. Open patents are, unless you had something that was totally classified from a military standpoint, if you worked and designed something for NASA, that patent was available for everybody. You could not, uh, the reason people have patents is to prevent other people from creating the same thing and profiting from your intelligence. But they expire, right? But NASA's patents were open. Did something for NASA, everybody could see it. Uh, CPFF, this is a different kind of contract. It's a cost plus fixed fee and cost plus incentive fee. <coughs> if we were asking a contractor, we were going out for bids, and we didn't know that it existed, we would give the contractors incentive payments if they succeeded or if they got it done faster. Uh, it was a different way of government contracting that NASA perfected. And then spread out through the rest of the, rest of the government too. DOD now, now uses that contract form. Uh, we had progress reporting, purchasing. All these things were done in a way to get things done. And by the way, you don't need to take pictures of these slides. If you guys want the slides, I'll make them available to you. And then you get a lot better resolution than you will in your little cell phone camera. <laughs> <coughs> KT uh, stands for Ketnatrago. Ketnatrago is one of the uh, problem solving systems. I got involved in Ketnatrago when John Clark, who ran the Goddard Space Flight Center, was charged with other centers to figure out what the heck happened to Apollo 13. You know, we had none of the evidence was left. But we had telemetry, we had data, and slowly but surely, Kepnatrago is a process that allows you to figure out what, where's the deviation, what is different that made things happen. Anyway, this was solved at three different centers using that technique. Uh, it, it, I, it was brilliant, I think. Uh, and <clears throat> I've, I've applied that in, in, in other parts of my career. NASA still uses it. Uh, lots of things in chemistry, my goodness. We had all kinds of uh, metallurgical advances, d batteries, uh, we developed fuel cells, uh, Hamilton Standard up in uh, Connecticut were the ones that supplied them to NASA and they did it under contract and they had to have a certain voltage and amperage and things like that. Uh, a lot of environmental chemistry as a result. Uh, lots of solar system metrics. NASA finally figured out, with precision, where every planet was, and every moon around every planet. We learned an awful lot about the solar system as a result of uh, spacecraft that we sent out to the outer planets. We have visited every planet, uh, or flown by every planet. Uh, <coughs> communications and bandwidth enhancement, so we could get data streams from our, our satellites 
that were around Jupiter or Uranus or Neptune and get enough data sent enough uh, with enough speed and, and antennas that would capture them here on Earth. Uh, lots of advances in meteorology, of course, that's, that's my area here. And I have translated that into my climate talks. Some of you guys have heard some of them. And they're on, they're on my website in case you're interested. Lots of advances in space flight. Aviation, of course, NASA is aviation and ASA. Aeronautics <coughs> is, is, is the second, second letter in, in the NASA logo. Again, the uh, miniaturization. We didn't develop transistors. We used them, integrated circuits, microchips. Uh, the antennas I already talked about. GPS is an outgrowth of NASA. You know, I, I have a little, in my iPhone, I can find out exactly where I am. And I've, I've used it all over the world. I've used it in Europe, I've used it in China uh, <clears throat> because of the, the satellites that we put in orbit. We know exactly where we are. Uh, household electronics are improved. Er, er, everything that we do here. Well, so here's, this is Buzz's uh, logo again, going to Mars. This is a schematic of what we would do uh, if we would land on Mars. Uh, trying to think of the guys who did this. Petrov is one of them. I'll think of the other guy's name. <clears throat> it's a project he did in, in 1988. Uh, and this is the, the design of the habitation on the planet Mars for, to protect from radiation. They, they would burrow into a hill. Uh, there's some flaws here. They relied a lot on New, uh, fusion, not f uh, fusion, but fission power. And uh, if you're going to rely on fission power, you need a lot of lead. Lead's very heavy. Getting lead to Mars is not going to be that simple. All right. Uh, <clears throat> here's the, the point I'm making. It's not going to Mars or going to Phobos that makes a difference. It's what you learn in getting there, the technology you develop. It's how well you, you use it. Humanity will flourish as you spread that knowledge all over the world. And I have my, my issues about not letting the poor people in South America or Africa or other poorer parts of the world develop and flourish. They deserve to flourish the same way everybody in this room has. You <clears throat> would make anyone living in a jungle hut very jealous. The clothing you have, the automobiles you have, the technology that's at your disposal, the medical help you're going to get. And again, the last thing I say is spacefaring is a wonderful alternative to war. If we put our energies into spacefaring instead of our energies into fighting one war after another, and we just had a president before us, starts four wars in eight years. That's not how we want to do what we want to do with our lives. I'm going to end it here. Not the one here. right now, but the last one. Excuse me? Not the one right now, but the last Yes. 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 The yes. former, yes. former yes. past president. Yes. 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 I'd like to yes. follow up on one, one thing if I might. OK, do it, because i got a couple more slides. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, oh, go ahead. No. Go ahead. Good. That's on topic. My next slide's on it. OK. The uh, conversation has been really how, you know, if you look at the space program, how it cuts across so many different technologies. And there are, a lot of these are, are very specialized and, and they have to be coordinated. I, I wanted to put in a, a statement or a plug for uh, 40 years ago, I started a uh, space architecture program at the University of Houston. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been now financially self supporting for over 30 years uh, through gifts and contracts and so on. We have students from all over the world. Uh, I'm from Siberia, I'm from Central America, and so on. We typically have about 20, 20 students. And, uh, they're, they're, and they come from physics, they come from design fields, they come from, uh, a lot of them from design. You know, we, have a, we have two two degree tracks. One is aerospace engineering and space architecture, mm -hmm. which comes into strictly to the engineering side. And then we have one that's space architecture. So we're administratively part of the College of Engineering. And uh, our budget, you know, we have 
several million dollar budget uh, that all self-generated that uh, in, in, in we're supported by that budget I'm process of trying to augment that with several million more uh, but, but it's, it's a wonderful program and the thing that makes it so different from a lot of the other fields is it's the only program of its kind in the world where 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 all of the, is all of these disciplines come together to work on projects and they learn they learn each other's language they learn both culturally as well as technically they learn each other's languages it's, it's very exciting and very rewarding to me to be part of that. Uh, when, when I, I'm still on the faculty, I still, I still supervise graduate thesis projects. Bonnie Dunbar, who was a five-time astronaut, replaced me as director when the, when the program transferred the engineering from Regional Architecture. Now, my former associate director, Ola Banov, is, is heading the program. I'm chairing the executive from the committee of it. But it's, it's, it's a very exciting program, and about a week or two, uh, it's kind of, an, kind of a nice development. NASA now, for the first time, has a space architecture office, and, and, and it's headed by one of our graduates. So the space architecture, I think, has kind of finally got, finally can come into its own. We have, we have our graduates working in programs all over the world. Uh, you know, the, the, the chair of the, of the central bank, uh, the new chair, her, her son just graduated from a program that's here, the European Central Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, we, have, uh, we have a marvelous bunch of graduate students. I'm, I'm, being around being around the universities I have been for so many years, I'm very excited about the young people today. Each of us, I think, probably say, well, weren't we not we a smart generation? I want to tell you, the next generation is just as smart as we are. Mm -hmm. and, and I find that enormously uh, encouraging, and I think those of you who have children and grandchildren can appreciate that. We, you know, we, we have some, there's a lot to be very excited about. And um, the space, I think the space program, I say one other thing. The public support space for, you know, the broad support is very thin. And it's always the question of why are we spending money on this versus something else? Well, India and other countries are saying the same thing. Why are we just and then say, well, we don't want to be left behind technologically. Part, part of the reason I think we support space is that it, it lifts us to think about something larger than ourselves. And then whether, whether it's religious philosophy or whatever you want to call it, it connects us to the cosmos, it connects us to higher thinking, greater challenges. It's about, it's about saying that it still needs to live it. I need to get a picture of that, that image. But it's, it's that, that notion that uh, we're part of something very, very large. I look at these, the, they say these t-shirts had the Milky Way galaxy on them. And a little sign, little arrow said, when you are here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought you can, two ways you can read that. You can look at that and you say, well, we're really small and insignificant. We're off, stuck off in one little spiral arm of the Milky Way. Well, we sure are insignificant. And you say, God damn it, we're part of something really big. You know, and, 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 and I think it's, it's a matter of how we, how we interpret that. We also, we also see technology and in fact the space race. Space grew out of the ashes of war. They came out of Pia Monday, they came out of Mount Brown, they came out of rockets raining down on London, you know, and directly came out of that because a lot of that technology you know, you know, morphed into what we have today. And then we had Apollo Soyuz, you know, other, you know, some friends of mine on both sides, uh, astronauts, cosmonauts, friends of mine both, then embraced over the Atlantic and and saying, well, you know, the Earth's kind of too, you know, we shouldn't blow it up. It's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of fragile, it's kind of nice to have around. Kumbaya, <laughs> and can we get, all get along? I think that that same philosophy persists today. We see North Korea and, 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 and Iran is imagining rockets raining down on us and having EMP attacks on our energy grid and so on. And then we say, but, uh, yeah, but, but, but let's go to Mars together because, we, you know, like George Abbey, let's all get together and let's build something initially. You know, Universal thing. So, so speak, and, and or we need the next generation of Teflon, or we we need to push fusion, or whatever. There's all these different reasons that we we want to do it. Some of them are very practical, pragmatic. Some of them are are very spiritual. And somehow we have to pull all these things together. But but the only way that'll happen is if we show milestones of progress. 
the public lost interest in Apollo halfway through the program because it started looking repetitive. And I, and I think that uh, in order to get public support, we need to, doing you know, flow diagrams isn't going to get us anywhere with the public. We have to, we have to show progress, you have to, and, and I think one of the encouraging things now, all my students have, all my parents particularly have jobs before they graduate from my program. They're not going to NASA, they're going to commercial companies. And I think that that's the exciting new paradigm, I think we're seeing where now that you know the technology is not just going out from NASA and making other people smart. We NASA and the space force has always been an importer of technology. And for that reason it, it energizes and, 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 and incentivizes these developments. They're not created by bureaucrats. They're created by capitalists. And 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 universal. And and I think we're seeing something very, very exciting today where, and I, I think Musk is kind of a showman and so on, and, and Bezos, you know, I think it's more serious, but but it's still it's inspiring a lot of the young people today to, to think that things are gonna happen in their lifetime. And I think a, a lot of our generation has sort of given up that hope. And, and, and I think we're now in a, we're kind of now on a roll, on a roll, and, and we've got a, you got to keep that going, and, and I think I think the commercial sector is, is a very exciting development. When we started Space Industries International to build an orbiting laboratory, that was a long time ago. I think we I think we missed the wave in terms of being ahead of the time, but I think that time now is here, and, and uh, we live in an exciting time. I've never been more excited and enthusiastic about the prospects of space than I am today, and, uh, and I see it in I see it in the hiring of my students. So. Okay. A couple more slides. You've been diverted into thinking about climate. All right. Uh, the newspapers are full of it. Uh, there's another way you're full of it. But, uh, this is something that you ought to be concerned about. This is the recent solar activity on, on our sun. And this is sunspot activity. There's an 11 and 22 year cycle in our sun. It's very well documented. Uh, the peaks are, are high sunspot activity. The lows are where it gets down to zero, where it actually touches the bottom here. You have no sunspots. Well, there's some strange things happening recently. Number one, you notice a trend is going down. Each trend is lower than the one before. And what's worse, we're now here, right, okay? Take a look what, I'm gonna go back up here a little bit. This is cosmic rays. Cosmic rays do things to our upper atmosphere. When they hit the atmosphere, they ionize particles upon which water vapor can condense. Means they make more clouds. You notice there's a pattern here. And what I've done on the next slide is I've matched that pattern to the solar pattern. The year here is exactly precisely under the year here, okay? Mm -hmm. And you notice in the peaks of cosmic rays, there are, uh, excuse uh, sunspots, there are fewer cosmic rays. When you have the lulls, you have more cosmic rays, which means more clouds, more ionization of particles, and it goes down again. But you notice the trend in sunspots is down, the trend in cosmic rays is up meaning we're getting more albedo on the planet. The albedo is reflectivity. When, when the sunlight hits clouds that wouldn't be there but for the cosmic rays, that sunlight bounces off of wavelengths that CO2 doesn't intercept. It makes the planet slightly cooler. We have had no increase in, in heating. This is what it looks like in a La Nina year. These are clouds over the equatorial Pacific. And when sunlight hits those, it goes off, and there's a lot of clouds here, okay? More cosmic rays, more clouds. Cooler planet. Uh, a quick slide on sea level trends. This is the east coast of the US. Sea level is different. Now, it's the same ocean. How come the sea levels are different? Well, the answer lies in tectonics. Uh, the up and down movement of the Earth. So in Virginia, 
you have a lot of sinking land and the sea level is perceived to be increasing. What's a real sea level? Uh, there should be a graphic here that shows, well, didn't, didn't work, didn't show up. But you see there's no acceleration of sea level in areas that are tectonically inert. You have a very consistent linear increase in sea level, exponential increase in CO2. Do you see any influence whatsoever of CO2 on sea level? I don't see it. Uh, here's New York City. New York City is, again, if I go back a couple of slides, uh, it's up here. Sea level is, quote, rising, not as much as Virginia, uh, less than Portland. Why is New York having sea level increase? Well, you have these huge buildings of structural steel and concrete and water towers pressing down on the bedrock. That goes into an area of the Earth called the asthenosphere. So New York is sinking under its own weight and the sea level is, quote, rising. However, that rise is still linear. Mm -hmm. It's not being affected by CO2. It should be off a chart if CO2 had anything to do with it. Uh, okay, and that's it for my, my slides on, on, on the climate slides. And I'm willing to take any questions. By the way, my sea level presentations are on my website on the media page. You can actually look at them, and some of them have a lot more detail. I just wanted to briefly show them. The climate thing is a scare. It is diverting resources from things like, uh, like NASA that will improve the world, and is putting them into things that have no impact whatsoever. On my website, you see some other slides. Number one, where I show that CO2 actually helps the world get greener. Mm -hmm. That means people can eat more. Yeah, that's it. Uh, oh, yeah, the, the, the Sahel in the uh, uh, <coughs> Southern Sahara Desert has close to 20% more green than it did when we first had satellites in orbit. Why? Mm -hmm. Because of CO2. Uh, I don't want to have us divert resources where they belong. I, I, I'm using an analogy now, and this is going to be depressing but I want it to be enlightening. I live in Maine. It's real cold in Maine. When the power goes out, and it does once in a while in the winter, the house gets real cold. I can light a candle in that house. But if I light that candle, the house is not going to heat up. I want you, each of you, to see yourselves <coughs> as lighting a candle for your own intellect and realize that's not going to change the world. But when you leave this room and you light your candles in other groups and talk to more people, sooner or later you will change the world. And you need to help change the world. You need to help people understand the truth. You need to un let them understand the fraud that's going on in climate and where the resources need to be put, whether it's going to Mars, whether it's doing other things that help humanity. The climate change hoax is not helping humanity. It will help destroy humanity. It's your job. Uh, let, me, let, let, let me jump on one, one thing on there. Go to it. Just, just show you how, how absolutely uh, crazy this is. You, you Google, of course Google's going to turn it <laughs> but, but you check and you and you ask the Energy Information Administration. You say very very simple question. You say how much of our energy comes from wind and solar? Simple question, right? How much of our U.S. energy comes from wind and solar? Very simple question. I will bet the answer you get is we get 37 percent. I think those numbers are coming out nice. 30 percent of our of our electricity comes from renewable energy, like renewable sources. Say, I didn't ask you that. I didn't ask you how much electricity we get from renewables. I asked you how much energy, and energy is, is BTUs. 
We know you know that, right? Then my energy is equal to E2. How much of our energy do we get from wind and solar? So it says, well, we get, uh, so, so, so if you peel back the numbers, of the 37%, and now there's four energy sectors. There's, there's, there's electricity, there's transportation, there's industry, and I think there's business and, and residential. Okay, how much, how much, uh, but, but of, of, the, of these, uh, the initial ones, the, 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 the renewables, how much of the renewable sector of electricity comes from wind and solar? Say, well, 40% comes from, 40% of the 17% comes from, comes from biomass. Oh my gosh, I thought that produced carbon dioxide. Am I, am I mistaken here? <laughs> And then there's and then there's another uh, significant percent that came out with 18 percent that comes from hydropower. Great if you live in the Pacific Northwest. We don't have a lot of hydropower dams in, in use that I've seen. Nope. You know, or 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 uh, you know, so so we have, you know in hydropower. Uh, we have nuclear power. We do for a while until you know until the last of the you know, the old reactors are closed down. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's maybe 18, 20 percent of electricity. What it comes down to is maybe we get five percent combined of our electricity from from wind and solar. Now, 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 if, but if you're looking across the board, we have all these, you know, self-driving cars. We're all gonna, you know, we're gonna drive. You know, the farmers gonna drive their their, their watermelons in in, in an Uber, right? <laughs> in, in, in a Tesla, in a Tesla. Or um, we get about th less than three percent of our of our energy from wind and solar. Now, now, I peel back the onion a bit. Of that, of that wind and solar, they're intermittent, mm -hmm. and so you have to have a what they call a spinning reserve of energy because we have an antiquated grid. It's about a hundred years old, and we, fortunately, in Texas, we have our own grid. And there's a couple of others. So to keep the grid balanced, you have to have an equal amount. Of and what's that? Most it's coal, but mostly mostly natural gas. So in order to keep the grid balanced with its stupid wind and solar, you got to have a turbine you crank up and down. It's like driving your car in heavy traffic, and you just it up and you drive it down. You know? You'd be better off turning off the damn windmill, you know. And, and so and but but here's the dirty little secret. They're going to tell you. I mean, they're all dirty little secrets. Here are the secrets. You know what the, you know what the life cycle of a wind turbine is? It's like 14 years. So we're going to cover the planet. We're going to replace 80% of our of our fossil fuels with the 2%. We're going to boost it up, like like Germany did. And they, they they had a 15 15 time increase in, in in wind and solar in Germany. They never had a brownout or blackout, you know, up, up until a few years ago. Now they have like 3,000. You know, and, and, and their energy costs are among the highest in the world. Yeah. And they want to build more wind and solar power. It's inter and it's, you know, this is, this is, and, and the more wind you create, the less good the sites are. Because, because the winds are, they're, they're shielding, you know, they're shadowing each other. And the notion that you can put cows and people underneath those, those windmills is crazy because, it, because the low frequency sound will drive you crazy. And make you sick, and, and nobody wants them around you. And the birds fall. And, and the birds, <laughs> and, and you gotta, and you gotta, you gotta shift the wind from some West Texas, mm -hmm. you know, to to here where you have transmission losses mm -hmm. that make it very inefficient. Well, Guys, that's this that's is crazy, crazy. And, and 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 people have no no sense of this. You know, they talk about the Green New Deal. We're gonna we're gonna replace eighty percent, and at the same time we're we're losing nuclear capacity. We're going to replace it with windmills and sunbeams. He said, "Well, it's new technology. Tell that to the Dutch." Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and and it's, it's 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 and again, it's going back to the notion that we have a, a, a society of total illiterates. They have no sense of and and why can't I call the Energy Information Administration and get a straight answer when I ask them how much of our energy, U.S. energy, do we get from wind and solar? And until I get a straight answer to a very, very simple question, I don't trust them. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add one more thing, okay? I'm going to give you a factoid that you can take out of here. 
<laughs> and this comes from the IPCC. And what they have done is measured CO2 worldwide, what the source is. And the fact is, most of the CO2 entering the atmosphere each year comes from outgassing of the oceans, from natural sources. 3% comes from humans, human source, 3%. Half of that is reabsorbed by plants and other things. So the human contribution of CO2 each year is one and one half percent of all the CO2 that's added each year. If the UN targets are made by some of the countries that have agreed to them, and they each agree to reduce their output by maybe 2%, 3%, 4%, but they're taking it off of that one and a half percent. We don't have the instrumentation that can measure whether that works or doesn't work. It is so small. And to spend trillions of dollars <coughs> in devices that either sequester CO2 underground or remove it is absolutely criminal. We need to add CO2 to the atmosphere, help plants grow, provide more food, lots of other things, even warn the planet. I am stunned by the fact that Canadians are talking about making the planet cooler. <laughs> right? and, and by the way, I was interviewed by a Canadian journalist uh, when I gave a, a talk in Germany. And I'm going to put that on my website in a couple of days. I haven't been able to fire up my computer because I've been traveling. But there I asked again this Canadian uh, journalist, why would Canadians want to have a cooler planet. I don't understand that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question. Yeah. Yes, you always ask some questions. Doesn't the IPCC uh, distinguish between uh, natural CO2 and they, call, they have a part for one called uh, uh, fossil fuels emissions? That's part of that 3%? Only yeah, that's part. What are the charts? They're just showing the, uh, the, the 3%. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to give, I brought a digital presentation I wanted to show you. This is my digit. And this is my presentation. And I'm going to give you a little, a little, a little brief history to pick up. Here's 400,000 years, okay? Can you imagine that? Here's 400,000 years. So the world goes through a 90,000 years of ice age. And, goes, and then we have a little interglacial. It's about 12, 15,000 years. Ooh. And then it goes another 90,000 years. Another little interglacial. So we live in a blip. We live in, a, we live in an interglacial that ended about 12,000 years ago, approximately. I wasn't around. I can't verify that. Is that started? Uh, so, so, but let's fast forward. Let's go into our little blip. We, in, in the 12, 15,000 years, it was the last one. You know, a little blip. So I'm going to fast forward. A couple thousand years ago, people wore togas and sandals for good reason. It was called the Roman warm period. It's just warm as today. And then we kind of fast forward another thousand years of the middle, is medieval warm period. And that's when Erica Red and his band went to Greenland and raised sheep and goats. Well, I spent a year in Greenland airport. I didn't see sheep and goats. Uh, I mean, not, not a single sheep. Not, they would have been welcome. I would have loved to see something live and welcome besides you know, Arctic foxes and caribou. But, but nevertheless, now no, I'm fast forward. Around 13, you know, Eric Durant, his, his guys, he was dead, but, it's, but it's, his family had a good, good sense of the hell out of there. Because it started getting cold again. And so, the, and then it, it cold, and then, and then, then we have something called the Little Ice Age, and that's when you showed, you know, the mountain minimum, you showed where, where, the, where the cosmic rays, you know, where the sunspot activity, grand minimum, you know, and so on, and the cosmic rays and yeah. the cooling. Yeah. So from about 1350 to around 1850, we had something called a little ice age. It wasn't a real good time. We had Irish potato famine, a lot of a lot of bad stuff happened, a lot of a lot of extreme weather. And so and so we had that period. So then then around 1777 when George Washington's troops were at Valley Forts, I wasn't there either. I can't, you know, but I heard about it. And and Washington and, and, and Napoleon's troops were leaving Moscow in eighteen twelve, you know, kind of it was a real cold period. A little bit after that it started getting it started warming up again. The end, it was around 18, 1870, 1850, 1870, climate started warming again. But here's where it really gets interesting. Around 1938, I, I do take credit for this, I was born that year. 
it was the, like the warmest year in, in 100 years. And I really, I really heated it up. And, 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 but look at what happened. What happened, and we, we had warming from the early 30s to the mid 40s. What happened in the 40s? We had a world war. We had the Second World War, and in the Second World War, we had Japanese and Germans and Europeans and Americans putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what happened? What happened? We had carbon dioxide went up, and the climate went flat to cooling for three decades, from the mid 40s to the to the late 70s, and suddenly the next ice age is coming, right? It's gonna, it's you got a glacier, it's, it's charging into New York, it's gonna crush Manhattan, and so on. And, and all, you know, you're reading about the New York Times, you know, boom, you know, the ice age is coming. What's causing it? Coal. The particulates from, you know, the, you know, from coal, okay. So, so we had a, we had a scare of an ice age in the late, late 70s. All of a sudden, what, eight years, ten years later, Al Gore, 1988. The climate's on fire. We've got to pass the Kyoto Protocol. Because if we don't, we're doomed. We've got to, we've got to form an intergovernmental panel on climate change not to find out what's happening, but to find out why we're causing it. <laughs> you know, when suddenly there's a crisis. It's ten years later, we just had an ice age that just barely missed us. The glacier <laughs> just made a swerve around the Manhattan <laughs> and melted and, and raised the ocean. Well, it didn't raise the ocean because the oceans have not raised seven inches per century the last couple of centuries. So, so you know, and we have some sizes. So anyway, so we had we had suddenly we have to pay the you have to you have to. We have to form IPCC, we have to pass the Kyoto Protocol. We got a railroad engineer that heads up IPCC. You know, again, but, but it's okay because Al Gore got a Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> but so, so and, then, and, then, and then what happened? 1988, 1998, we had a major El Nino. And, and you know, El Nino is, is a warm period. We had another around two, 2014. The people in college today have never known global warming in their life, not in their lifetime. Don't tell them that. But, <laughs> but statistically, there's been no warming. That's right, since 1998, we've been flat. Yeah. And so the, the whole notion that extreme weather is getting more extreme, it's not true, you can, you can check that. They're not more, it's not more frequent, they're not more severe. Have the oceans accelerated? No, they haven't. Uh, uh, are there more forest fires? No, there aren't. Uh, and, and, and you can go right down the list to all of these, all these crazy things. And, and so, so what happens is we're, I'm called a climate change denier. I've never met anyone that denies the climate changes. Have you ever met anyone that met? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, 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 uh, it's absolute lunacy. And, and they, admit, they admit that it's used, it being used to drive the economy, you know, they absolutely admit it. They've said it, and and uh, at least that's the only thing they're being honest about. They're looking to raise taxes, taxation, follow and, the and money, read the mm -hmm. follow well. the money. Exactly. Hey, by the way, in, in all fairness, mm -hmm. I am number two seventy one. What is two seventy one? Nature, one of the most distinguished climate publications, in June, put out an article. It's called Nature Communications. And they listed people who you should not listen to. <laughs> in order, or in order of severity. I think Larry has a much higher number than I have. <laughs> but I'm 271. It went down to 360. Hal Dwar and my, coll my colleagues are on there. A couple of you guys are on there, too. Thank you, <laughs> No, 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 I didn't beat you. You're ahead of me. You have to be ahead of me. <laughs> in, in any event, I'm 271. I'm giving you fair warning. The most distinguished publication in the world on climate says you should not listen to me. Who's number one? However, I want, oh, uh, I think Mark Moran is number one. However, I want every one of you to use your intellect and make your decision as to what you hear here or anywhere else is true, may be true, is false. I know that from my brain and from my, my, my heart, I am telling you the absolute God's honest truth. I will continue to do that until I'm no longer talking. And I know Larry is doing the same thing. And so is Keisha. All right, so celebrate our intellect, folks. Yeah. Okay, we got...
a couple more questions before we take questions, though, because I don't want uh, anyone else to leave. I just have one, a, a couple of brief announcements here. Um, because, I mean, first of all, I want people to think about this, that we are having to commit so much of our time right now talking about that going after this evil policy of reducing carbon, zero carbon emissions, and as uh, both uh, Tom and Larry have said, you know, you think about this, the bankers want to put billions of dollars into this, but at the same time, we just had the U.S. Congress uh, in the House completely say there is no money for the Artemis program, or, or the Senate say we're going to cut the Artemis program in half, and for those of you who have been completely blocked, I hope you haven't been so blocked this that you would not know that our current president, Trump, has said that we're going to commit our nation to going back to the moon and on to Mars with the program of sending the first woman and the next man to the moon again, just what we were talking about here, because we're not here to reminisce on the good old days and say, oh, that was nice while we had it. You know, those of us who could have participated in the optimistic future of a national mission of getting human beings to uh, make these great breakthroughs and discoveries and sending the first human beings into space, well, that happened, but those days are over. No, those days are not over, and that's why we're here talking about this, because next week I invite you all to come back. We won't be here. We'll actually be at the uh, Clear Lake Freeman Branch Library out by NASA, um, and we're going to be hosting an event on uh, one, supporting not just the Artemis program, but why we have to go as one humanity. We need to be working with leading nations, work Russia, China, India. Uh, as you, people know, the president was just here in Houston uh, with over 50,000 Indians and the Prime Minister of India, uh, Narendra Modi, and they talked about there that we're going to go into space together. We got to do this together, and we're not going to do it when you got some idiots in the Congress right now who are more concerned about impeachment and policies for reducing carbon footprints. So I just wanted to say that because next week is very special. It is actually uh, Space Week. This is going to be uh, International Observe the Moon Night on October 5th, which is uh, Saturday, and our meeting is going to be at 1.30 p.m. at the Clear Lake Library. I encourage everybody to come out. Uh, we're not just celebrating looking at the moon. We're saying that this is the direction that all nations participating together, that's why they're calling it uh, Space Week, uh, uh, World Space Week. So I encourage people, look, we have to take the gloves off right now. We really we need you all to say, look, let's give our young people a future. Let's actually put some pressure on these Congress members. And that means that the people who are opposing these idiotic policies, they have to speak out more. Even the conservatives who think they have it made in the shade and that they don't have to fight, they have to fight. Uh, they have to fight more than anybody right now. But the key thing right now is, as I said, um, we've laid out here a very clear picture as to the two worlds before us and what kind of world do we want to see our children and our grandchildren living in. So again, I encourage people, make sure you leave your name and phone numbers and your email addresses because we want to send you invites out to our up upcoming event and um, take some material with you on the way out. So otherwise, there are a couple more questions here. I want to go ahead and get to those. Well, the, uh, the Artemis mission all right, that uh, Trump had proposed is, is uh, I mean, of course, the, the Democrats in the House didn't want it because, because Trump's name is attached to it and they want to impeach him. But in the Senate, what excuse can the Republicans offer? What, how could they possibly want to cut this in half? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> they can't get any votes politics. Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. They don't have any excuses. We were instructed earlier not to let you get away without mentioning a little bit about the colonization of Venus. Uh, 
I don't have a slide for it, okay. but I can okay. tell you tell you about uh -huh. what some of the potential is. All right? Yes, sir. Venus has an atmosphere of uh, ma mainly carbon dioxide. I got plenty. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> it it is non-transparent in the sense that. It reflects incoming sunlight, but it's closer to the sun. It also traps the heat in a huge way. Mm -hmm. Surface temperature of Venus is about eight to 900 degrees. Lead can melt on Venus. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russians have put a lander on Venus. Mm -hmm. It took three pictures before it, it basically melted. Mm -hmm. All right, but it was able to transmit those pictures back. Mm -hmm. so we have pictures of the surface. Terraforming is taking a planet and changing it so that it resembles Earth. Earth is Terra, all right? We could parachute devices onto Venus, onto the Venusian surface, that would strip the carbon and oxygen from each other. The carbon would be ending up as, as like coal dust on the surface of the planet. The oxygen would enter the atmosphere of the planet. Mm -hmm. You put enough of these machines on the surface and very slowly but surely, the atmosphere of Venus changes. The surface is coated with carbon. Some of it will seep into the, into the, into the Venusian surface. Once the atmosphere is transparent enough for the oxygen to be the principal component, mm. the atmosphere becomes transparent. So that Venus will then lose its heat thousands of years in the future. Mm. We would be able to land on Venus with an oxygen atmosphere, it's a warmer planet, and then we have carbon for energy in the ground, oxygen in the air to breathe, it will be a first step. All right, that's the process that we use to terror, and Venus is as large as Earth. There's enough room for many, many people. Venus would then end up having a pole where there would be, you could have frozen water. Uh, it would be, a, there'd be a possibility of inhabiting Venus. Now the Mars uh, pictures I showed you, that was Mackenzie and Petrov. They're the ones who did that. And anybody who wants to have those slides, and there's plenty of them, by the way, in Mackenzie and Petro, 70 pages worth of material on how those humans- Those weren't quite Renaissance cities on Mars, though. I'll give you some No, words. no, 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 no. <laughs> but their, their, their belief is that colonizing Mars is much easier than Venus, because Venus, terraforming Venus, is something that would take thousands of years. Right. Whether our humanity can do that, can do it well, I don't know. I won't be here to see it. Uh, I might be here to see the first steps taken toward getting to Mars and finally getting people to live on Mars. We have room on Mars for people. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, two things. One is, um, just in that regard, um, my husband brought up this question previously. And he's, he wasn't able to come today, but, uh, and I know he'd probably like your idea about um, how do you, how do we go about uh, terraforming Mars when, you know, there's no magnetic field, um, when we're dealing with the, the problem there of creating an atmosphere, okay? And then the second question is, I, I thought maybe, I don't know if Keisha got the report on it, but um, there is Let a, me answer the first question okay, first. Yes, okay, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, the Martian colony that Mackenzie and Petra see is basically burrowed into the hills of the planet and the parts that are exposed are to grow plants. The plants will produce food and oxygen, right? You get enough plants growing and Mars has CO2 in its atmosphere, the plants will grow a little bit quicker than they would here on Earth. Mm -hmm. So the plants would create the atmosphere that the people would breathe who were inside the tunnels borrowed into the hills. So you won't create the atmosphere on Mars as an atmosphere itself, but in the human habitations, you would be able to have a, a breathable atmosphere. 
Okay, okay. now your second question. Okay, so um, there is a petition of, of scientists uh, denouncing, the, maybe you mentioned it before I got here. I the 500 scientists, yes. they're sitting in the room. Some of them are here, they signed it. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I okay. I just, but you, you yeah. yeah. He, she's talking I wanted to. I'm on there too. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, there was um, a, a, just an update on it that I, I heard a little bit about today. Tell, I, did, I may not have gotten it. Go ahead. Say say what it was. Um, I don't know. Did anyone get it all? I only got like 30 seconds of it, but it was. Uh, I thought maybe uh, you might have heard it, but it was. Did. Anyway, what was published? Anyway, it was very, very. I think. Can I'm gonna you have just to state what this is about. Yeah, can one of one of you who's I can, I can help you on yeah, that. Yeah. This yeah. is a petition that was actually started in Europe. Yeah. And I uh, ended up being the uh, on there as a signatory because I was giving a pre presentation in Europe mm -hmm. of speaking uh, at the German Bundestag and giving a sea level rise presentation along with the great Svensmark from from Denmark, mm -hmm. who was the cosmic ray expert. Uh, oh, and also Lord Moncton from England, oh. and uh, uh, Pressler, who is a glaciologist. So the four of us are presenting in the Bundestag. It's on my website. Unfortunately, when you hear me talk, you're not hearing me. You're hearing a simultaneous woman German translator. Uh, but I, have, I, you know, the slides are there. Anyway, this petition was started in Europe uh, by people in the Netherlands, and. Uh, about 500 scientists have signed on to it now, and it's a letter to the Secretary General of the United Nations, basically asking the Secretary General to look at the science and not look at the garbage that he's being uh, presented with. And, and like I say, I'm, I'm yeah. on there, a, a number of people that I know I are on the there. The update that I got was that so the initiators of this have actually now created a site that, and they're actually creating a, um, a, a they're institutionalizing resources uh, through a, a website which is going to allow people, for instance, including a portal for educating uh, youth, you know, youth education and the science of this. Um, uh, plus resources for um, uh, all kinds of documentation. They're going to have their own peer review process where they're going to be able to take reports that are, uh, you know, bogus reports and going through and actually showing what's wrong with them. I mean, it's 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 like a, a, a real escalation of putting this okay. stuff institutionally. One of my big yeah. worries, yeah. all right, okay. is that uh, Google or Facebook in the near future Suddenly may declare exist. this as uh, detrimental <laughs> to the uh, human beings and take these sites off. Yeah. It is possible. It is, uh, I've seen a couple of slides taken down already. Uh, I, I will subscribe to it. I will make sure that they, you know, I, I co-authored a paper about four months ago with the great uh, Neil Soxel Murder from Sweden uh, and there was a three, three author paper dealing with sea level rise and some of the misinformation that, that people are getting. It was published, but it was published in a European journal. Uh, here, being number 271, they will never publish it. <laughs> <laughs> Wikipedia also does a lot of, you know, if you Google my name, you'll pull up a lot of pages. Mm -hmm. uh, climate. Yeah. And, and what Larry, stand up so they can hear you. Yeah. yeah. They, they, uh, we do a couple of things. One is when uh, you Google my name or and whatever, though, it, it pulls up all of the articles that the trolls write. Mm -hmm. You know, that are attack articles, and, and and just one after the other. It might be me. There might be ten pages. I don't know about that. <laughs> and, I got and, a lot of those too. And, and then they have they have people. Actually, I guess I should be flattered who who follow every time everything I say, <laughs> and and they'll and they'll, they'll they'll publish it. My reaction would be, damn, I said that, that's pretty good stuff. <laughs> uh, you know. But, but the, the other thing they do is Wikipedia goes back in and, and revises. You know, they they guy, edit. What's the guy's name? Uh, they caught him and they fired him and they brought him back. But it's, it's part of the climate gate crowd. 
He was a co-founder of Real Real Clear Climate. Real, you know, what was that website? And so on. Anyway, it wasn't Hanson, was it? No, no, no. Uh, Gavin Schmidt. Was yeah, Gavin right. Schmidt. But but they uh, they go in and they find people's resumes, and they actually and they and they get away with it. So the you know that's when I you know, I read about this you know, this corruption of the media. You know, the social media is very very powerful. Uh, to you know, I think of people names that have been slimed. Fred Singer was having his ninety fifth birthday next week. Uh, mm -hmm. Marvelous guy. He was he and he and Buzz and I were big fans of Phobos many many years ago. We you know doing that. I visited him last month, by the way. He's uh, fading fast. I know. I heard that he's having a birthday party next week. I think. Yeah, as best as he can. I worry about. I mean, worry about that. But Willie soon has been totally trashed. And, uh, Mm -hmm. And we think of what they did to Will Happer, you know, when he went to the White House as a science advisor, and, and Dick Lindzen and MIT, I mean, them. They find, they find the target people, and they really, so you got to have a pretty thick skin to, you know, to be in this, in this business. My skin's pretty thick. Now I get yeah, into the as well. But, but the, it, I find it egregious. I don't, you know, I don't care, but I, you know, for me, I don't, you know, what I care. But I, I hate to have my friends trashed yeah. because they spent their they spent their whole life studying science and, and climate and have their lives and have their careers destroyed and, and just just absolutely trashed is is is, is pretty sad. Yeah. One, one, wait, wait, one good example. Willie Soon is one of the world's greatest solar physicists. Two years ago, as we were plunging into the depth again was basically taken out of circulation and fighting for his reputation when he should have been educating the world about what's happening to the sun. That's an absolute tragedy. And Willie's a good friend of mine. He lives pretty, fairly close to me. Uh, he's one of the greats. And uh, I'm going to support him as much as I can, as often as I can. <coughs> what's his name? Willie yeah. Soon, S-O-O-N. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, how do you deal with insinuations that you may have been uh, uh, compensated for signing the petition? Oh. Okay, this is, uh, this is fun. The kind of accusations that immediately arise. Yeah. Uh, it's a good leading question. All right, yeah. Thank you. I, I, I should have put, put you on the agenda. I didn't mean to do that. Okay, I'll, I'll sh in Berlin, I was asked in the Bundestag, you must be in the pay of the oil companies. Yeah. And I said, no, no, no. Oh, oh, yes, I said, I am. And I held up my little shell card here. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I get one penny euro cent per liter every time I take gas. And this is the total extent of my compensation for the oil companies. And here I get five cents a gallon. Sometimes I get Three. ten cents a gallon, by the way. <laughs> so the oil companies are definitely compensating me, but this is the sum total of every nickel I have gotten from the oil companies. Thank you, folks. This is all living right now. Yeah. You have right. Yeah, well, yes, sir. What, this sounds like the Moscow in the 60s. You know, if somebody pops up and says the emperor is <coughs> wearing no clothes, and they're instantly denounced and run out of town on a rail. Uh, and uh, good it's the same play, yeah, back to the good, but it's also the same playbook that mm -hmm. you see in uh, Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. That's right. That's right. And I think that Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals ought to be prime reading, just like they made us read Marx's uh, uh, manifesto back in the ninth grade <coughs> in the 70s. And, you know, but there is hope, okay? I'm riding in the car, and I have my seven-year-old back here, and I'm taking him to school, and on the radio comes the World Water Fund begging for money, because after all, only 3% of the water on the planet is drinkable. And my son's back there, and he starts giggling. He's seven years old. And I say, what are you laughing about? He says, Dad, fresh water falls from the sky. And what we need is the money to go to infrastructure, put up another dam so we can have fresh water because it falls from the sky. Amen. Okay. Yeah. You got a smart kid. 
Oh, you, you have no idea. Now he's 17 years old. And by the way, I can describe the emperor's clothing with precision. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, there was a reference made, uh, you know, to uh, uh, Russia in the 60s or whatever. But I think you have to bear in mind that what's behind this operation the same is one. the same right. financial powers that That's created right. Adolf Hitler in Germany. Oh, yeah. And, Cre yep. This and is Stalin. fascism. And created the Bolshevik Revolution and right. have never let up on the United States since the, the quote, revolution. I call it the War of Independence. <laughs> I don't want to use their name for it anymore. Yeah. All right, look. They've never lit up. You've got marching orders. Light your candles of intelligence. All Take the them around. Talk to your friends. Yeah. Talk to the people who aren't friends. I've lectured at New York City Sierra Club <laughs> often enough so they don't let me back. <laughs> <laughs> but but they've got, actually admitted. But they've gotten my message. message. They've Fine. gotten my message. And I'm not giving up. And by the way, I don't like pollution. I don't think like the poisons and our carcinogens that kill people, and I will fight to make our planet cleaner, but CO2 is not one of them. Well, that's one of the words, you know, they've been, they're really good at weaponizing words. Yeah. That's right. And when EPA came out and called CO2 pollution, you know, it's, it's game over. That's ridiculous. Or, or We're all other, polluters. The other thing is the 97% consensus. That's right. And, and no, I mean, that's no false. dignified organization would, would, would validate that poll. There wasn't any. No science, really. But, but it gets into the, that was, that was what, 79 people, you know, cherry picked people. Right. And, and any one of us would have answered yes to every one of those questions. Uh, but, but the ability to weaponize words, they're, they're masters at that. And we see it now with Trump, we see it as well. It's Russia, now it's racism, now it's, you know, it's, it's uh, Ukraine, you know. And, uh, yeah, I'm a racist and a homophobe and a bit and a bit and a I don't I don't follow the party line, so I'm all of these things. You know, I'm I'm constantly pushing the bog out there. I don't know if it's being intercepted or not, but most of my people are getting it. And then they're turning around and sending it out. Uh, don't stop. No, sir. I, I got one final stop. message. <coughs> Be optimistic because we are winning. They are losing. Uh, and so yeah, and so therefore uh, but realize that we have a job to do and we need more people on the, the good side of humanity. So well, the Schiller Institute. Yes. And the Schiller Institute is leading the good side of humanity. And hopefully you guys got a better sense of that. Any further questions you have, please ask us. As I said, take some material with you and I really appreciate everybody coming out today. The discussion has been great. And I want to thank my guest here, Tom. Larry. And oh, what? NASA TRCS is doing the same thing. We're getting the information out. That's right. Thank you, guys. <laughs>